Hello everybody and welcome to the PDP-1 talk. My name is Hroe and this is my first time at DORS. It's a great pleasure to be here, thank you all for coming. I'll tell you a little bit about an open hardware project I was working on a few months ago, an FPGA recreation of DEC PDP-1. Since I always wanted to learn about FPGA, all I needed was a challenge to keep myself mot motivated and an excuse to play around with old computers. Right around that time I was reading about Space War, the very first video game ever, and wanted to try it out, but the only operating PDP-1 still in existence is in the Computer History Museum in California. So what do you do when you can't get something? Build your own. So why do we even study old computers? Well, for one thing, they had very limited hardware resources and to get anything useful done, a lot of effort went into writing efficient and optimized software. As available hardware resources keep increasing, so does software complexity. These early days of computing can inspire us to try and put in a little extra effort in writing better and more efficient code. Their architecture was also much simpler, which makes them a good platform for teaching computer architecture. Consider the latest AMD EPIC with 19.2 billion transistors versus the PDP-1 with not nearly as many. Also, some of the, their influence we face daily without even knowing it. You all probably wrote a computer program which used a for loop and named the loop counter with letters I, J or K. And why do we use I for counters? Thanks to Fortran 2, which appeared in 1958, implicitly declared variable starting with the letters i, j, k, l, m, or n will be an integer and otherwise a floating point. And uh, these are used near about 60,000 times in the Linux kernel source tree. Even though times have changed, the basic principles have not. Consider how you might draw a pixel on the PDP-1 or how you might exit a program in Linux. Even though these instructions are completely different and the architectures are completely different, the basic principle applies. You put some values in registers and pass arguments through those. So the concepts haven't changed much. And at the bottom half of the, of the slide, you can see how you might loop seven times in both PDP-1 and x86 and just remotely you can see some similarities in the code. We still loop by testing if for example register value reach zero and jump conditionally so that also hasn't changed. What about the state of computing in the 50s? Well if you somehow managed to find a time machine and went back in time, you would be in for a surprise. Most of the things we know and love have not yet been invented. There is no ASCII, no C, no Unix, no Internet, nothing. But the main thing is that computers were not very interactive back then. The usual procedure was to punch a set of cards and hand them over to a computer lab and go get a printout a day later. What people wanted was being able to sit behind an actual computer and develop programs interactively. And that's where the PDP-1 shines. Digital Equipment Corporation used to make logic modules and decided to increase their profit margin by using them to make their own computer. It was designed in just three months back in 1959 by an engineer named Benjamin Gurley and many consider it to be the first real personal computer because it is designed to be operated by a single person. It ran at a blazing speed of 200 kHz and had an enormous amount of memory, 4K words. Grouping bits eight at a time was not common until the IBM System 360, which appeared a few, few years later. So PDP-1 featured 18-bit words at just over $1 million adjusted for inflation and with many interesting peripherals such as the CRT, a light pen, a teletype, it was a small rev revolution. It was also the very first commercial computer to feature a CRT screen as output device and more than a decade before they became widely accepted. Having a resolution of 1024 by 1024 which is almost full HD in 1959 was impressive by itself. 
Originally a radar CRT tube, it featured P7 phosphor coating with dual glow, which relieves a very long and slow decaying fade after a pixel being lit. That was a deliberate and fortunate decision, since the write time was very slow and it couldn't do more than 20,000 dots per second. It would take 52 seconds to redraw the entire screen if you wanted to light each and every pixel, which is a killer frame rate, right? There was also a light pen which can be used as an input device to draw on the screen. One of the first machines was donated to MIT and it turned out to be a great decision for DEC. It became so popular that students were showing up at random times during the night hoping somebody would sleep in and miss their time slot so they would have some time with the machine. DEC was desperately short on software and MIT students desperately short on hardware, so it was a match made in heaven. The students were constantly discovering new ways to squeeze more features from the li rather limited hardware and it led to impressive software routines for the day. One of the most impressive achievements is Space War, the very first video game which was unlike anything seen before. It was almost a decade ahead of its time. Made by Steve Russell and many other talented MIT students, it was a space shooter. It used many modern techniques like just-in-time compilation, self-modifying code, etc. And this is what it looks like. It's a two-player game featuring two spaceships, the needle and the wedge. Each is controlled by a player who can maneuver the ship around using rotation and thrust. Both ships are affected by the central star's gravity, and they are trying to hit each other using photon torpedoes. The background is a star field which moves, moves slightly during the game. The impressive feat is that the stars are actually real. Known as the expansive planetarium and written by Peter Sampson, they feature a 45 degree field of vision of the night sky as seen from the equator. Using data from the Nautical Almanac, even the star brightness is taken into account. The star field moves slowly and covers the entire sky. And the entire game, along with the math routines, the just-in-time compiler for the ship outline drawing, the stars, etc. used only 75% of the single bank of PDP-1 memory. There was the gravity, which was quite CPU intensive. It affects ships, but not torpedoes, because they, they, there simply wasn't enough CPU power left. You have a rocket engine, which you can use for ma maneuvering around. Both ships have torpedoes and try to shoot each, each other. The, of course, the player who shoots the other player wins, as usual. Uh, what about the flicker? Well. These gravity calculations are quite CPU heavy. These early computers, since the processor speed is, was 200 kilohertz, multiplications, divisions, square roots, that's all quite, quite uh, demanding on the CPU. And the bottleneck is time. You need to go through, through your main loop with a high enough frequency and redraw the screen to avoid any flicker. And after they put in the gravity calculations, the game started to flicker because they weren't executing the main loop fast enough. So, to produce a flicker-free display, there was something called the Outline Compiler made by Dan Edwards. That was the guy you might have seen a few slides back playing the Space War. He was the guy on the left. And this routine, once parsed, once executed per game, ran a parsed the ship's data and generated executable code, which was then used uh, and it was very fast and it improved the FPS. So the issues with FPS are basically as old as gaming itself. And a little bit about the emulator. It also runs on an FPGA board, but sadly it's not an ULX3S board because I didn't know about the guys at the time starting the project, otherwise I would surely use their board. Uh, the entire project is free and open source and the code can be found at GitHub. It runs on a Mr. platform which is uh, basically an off-the-shelf educational board which costs a little over $100. It, it features a powerful Cyclone 5 and 
It runs many other cores like the C64, the Amiga 500, the ZX Spectrum, even an x86. I think uh, 486 can be run along with original Doom and other games you might like. The project tries to emulate other peripherals like the console, teletype, uh, the CRT, paper tape reader, etc. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I did uh, each, each of these components. Well, the teletype, uh, what's needed is to divide the screen by 64 by 32 matrix. Why 64 by 32? Because they're nicely divisible by two, and that's a very good thing if you're doing anything in FPGA. Uh, each field represents one character, which is then looked up in a character set look, ROM lookup table. The font was chosen to match the original teletype used by the PDP-1. And this is how it looks. Uh, this is an output of the, of the teletype emulation. And it shows the output of a program called the Expensive Desk Calculator. It was made by a guy named R. Wagner, but not the composer. This was a whole different Wagner. He was a student at MIT and needed access to a calculator to finish his numerical analysis homework, but couldn't get one, so he decided to write one himself, which is kind of cool, because this became the first interactive calculation program ever in history. So this was the first time you could sit behind a computer, sit behind a teletype, type in mathematical expressions, and they would come out as solutions. It might not seem so revolutionary now, but it was, it was quite huge back then. And all of these old, old computers have consoles. So uh, this is what a console of the PDP-1 looks like. The consoles had lights and switches. The lights show the states of internal registers and the switches uh, can be used to input simple programs or to affect the program outcome. Uh, the background was drawn in Inkscape because we all like this program, right? And converted to a one bit bitmap and uh, placed in a ROM file. Then when the, each screen is drawn, uh, the bitmap is locked up in ROM and used as background. On top of this background are uh, placed the switches and the lights, so it all comes out quite nicely, I hope. And uh, the, uh, their values are sampled at 60 Hz to match the uh, vertical refresh rate, because any video signal you might generate is much, much lower than the rate of uh, change in the internal registers. Even back then, it uh, ran in the kilohertz range, not in the hertz range. So, what were some of the problems and challenges uh, encountered while making the CRT? So, the CRT has quite a high resolution, 1024 by 1024, which was an unusual for the time. And I simply categorically refused to try and uh, use any other video mode which was beyond, uh, 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 below 1024 lines. So the next mo standard mode was 1280 by 1024. And this required pixel clock of 108 megahertz, which was quite high. I had absolutely no idea how to use SGRAM to do it. This doubt might, but I didn't and I decided to went uh, along a block RAM route. Uh, this old CRT has uh, something called a phosphor decay. When you light up a pixel, it slowly fades away. It doesn't disappear immediately. So you also need, need to store this information somehow. And uh, if you wanted to st store the entire 1024 by 1024, by, uh, I don't know, 10, 10 12, uh, 16 bits of uh, brightness intensity data, you would uh, over, overdraw your available block RAM, so a different approach is needed. And it's important to note the PDP-1 screen is mostly dark. It's, 
it's, uh, it's relatively slow to refresh this CRT. So, so uh, all the programs, all, all the applications are basically uh, showing uh, quite a few number of pixels. And the solution I came to use was uh, to use the four shift registers connected back to back in a configuration I affectionately like to call a large pixel collider. And I don't have to explain the pun, I guess. Uh, at the splice points, pixel are, pixels are inserted and removed. Their brightness is modified. And after each clock runs, uh, their brightness is decreased by one. So after they run in the circle for a while, they, they get thrown out. And this, in fact, ended up working. So the CPU is quite unusual. It features an 18-bit word. Which, were, uh, which was unusual for the time, but nothing was usual for the time. Each manufacturer chose their own bit, uh, word length and 8-bit words, uh, which we now know as bytes, weren't even standardized until much later when the System 360 IBM came out. And if you ever complain about having to learn about two's complement, you should try one's complement, where, where you have two zeros. There's a plus zero and there's a minus zero. And you can make a lot of bugs with this. Uh, what they also did was reuse the uh, same opcode for two different instructions depending on the uh, revision of the PDP-1. So that was kind of a nightmare and it broke many programs. The lesson is never break backwards compatibility. And how do you go about verifying instructions? Well, uh, the people at Digital Equipment Corporation, after uh, finishing the PDP-1, needed to verify if it worked correctly. So they wrote a special set of programs which test some corner cases and edge cases where some instruction might not behave correctly. And in case this instruction, in fact, didn't work correctly, you would, the machine would halt. So if you manage to pass all the tests, then it meant your computer and your implementation was working. And these tapes were preserved and they were made available at bitsaver, bitsavers.org, which, which ended up being an amazing resource without which this program, this project would probably never work. And there's the issue of the music compiler. PDP-1 was actually one of the first computers which produced music. And it was it uh, probably was the first computer uh, which produced multiple voice music. So uh, early attempts included the computers making a single single voice single voice melody. But this was able to do four voice harmony and uh, there was no hardware inside which could facilitate in generating music. There were no hardware timer interrupts. There, there basically wasn't anything you could use to pr produce music out, outside of flipping the bits in registers at just the right time. And to do this, this brilliant guy called Peter Sampson wrote something called the music compiler. You can see in the column on the right, a notation of uh, a piece by Johann Sebastian Bach. And I guess it looks kind of confusing, but it was one of the first attempts to, to, do, uh, to produce a music def definition language. And uh, this compiler then uh, uses the input shown on the right to produce an intermediary format, which is then used uh, and loaded in a, in a player, which in turn ends up playing the music. So it's kind of amazing. It even has it even has additional features like vibrato, staccato, because Peter Sampson was a fan of classical music. So I really hope the demonstration will work and I will try to to demonstrate this to you. There were many attempts in emulation, but uh, I think, and after some email correspondence with Peter Sampson, supposedly nobody else did this anywhere. So there are only two locations where you can hear music from the PDP-1. One. one is in California and the other will hopefully be here <laughs> if the demo works. And demos never work, as we know. 
Well, uh, I also wanted to write a short piece of software. Well, after writing an emulator, you need to write a piece of software for it, right? That's got to be a law somewhere. And I tried to do something which, which was quite simple and chose doing Pong. Uh, Pong was actually a game which was made 13 years after the computer was designed. So it's kind of a weird backport. And it was quite challenging to do it because the, the assembly language of the PDP-1 is very, very strange. But in the end, I think I ended up doing it. and. You can sh see the video here. The video you are seeing is not uh, very high quality, but it shows uh, the Pong game running in California on the original PDP-1 computer, uh, thanks to the nice people of the Computer History Museum. So it actually works. And I'd like to thank some people. Lyle Bickley, Ken Summerall, Peter Sampson, Al Casso, and Norbert Lensteiner. This project would never be realized without them, and I'd like to take, thank all of you for listening. And it's demo time now. <laughs> and no, I'm not nervous. <laughs> nervous at all. <laughs>
No, <laughs> I better be. <laughs> okay, so this and this and this. So these are three circles which are kind of interdependent. Their positions are, are kind of interlocked and the author of this was the MIT professor Marvin Minsky, which discovered a whole other uh, circle drawing algorithm, which was kind of cool by playing around the PDP-1 and it's now known as a Minsky circle algorithm. So. There, there's a lot to be learned from these old machines. Let me show you the teletype. Just a second. Okay. So I'm going to load the calculator and hopefully it will work. Yes. So if we enter a number, something quite complicated we couldn't do ourselves and the answer will, would come up, out. And there are many more features I don't know by heart. You can, you, you can chain the expressions, you can use parentheses, and all sorts of, all sorts of, oops, sorry. Also sorts of different mathematical expressions and the answers would come out quite, quite quickly. So, this is something that was quite unusual for the time. There is also the debugger, which I never knew, uh, really learned how to use properly, <laughs> sorry. But it could disassemble the instructions and uh, pre uh, save you from having to flip the switches on the main console of the computer. So it was, it was also quite, quite useful. But what I, I would like to demonstrate for you now was the music, is the music playing ability. So I'm going to connect the speaker. One sec, one second, please. This piece takes around 90 seconds. I think we have enough time, so I would kindly ask you to listen for the entire piece and hopefully it will work. And just think what these people back in the 60s thought the future was going to bring when, okay, not that, but what the future was going to bring if they, they could hear the computer making music for the first time. So here goes nothing.
Any questions, people? <laughs> when can you play the game? Well, it's a lunch break now, so <laughs> come on, let's play. Yeah, you, you didn't mention that the, the, I, I didn't know, that the pong was uh, tested in uh, original. Yes, yes, I think I did. Uh, actually, uh, the, the game pong was ran on the original PDP-1 in California, and there is only one left in the world which is running. There were only 53 ever made, and most were scrapped and destroyed. There's one, I believe, in operational in London in their museum, and the other one is in California in the Computer History Museum. They spent, I think, uh, at least a year restoring it, and they they uh, took it apart, each logic module, they inspected it every each and every connection and wire, so it was a very tedious and long process, but in the end they ended up getting it to work and it's thought to be the only only one left in the world. And some of the quite known uh, names have visited uh, this museum and played around with it, like Bill Gates, uh, Vinton Cerf, etc., and Steve Wozniak and many others. So. So it's quite an important piece of history because it started the code sharing culture, the collaboration culture, all, all of the software back in MIT was open. The, all the paper tapes were placed next to the computer, all of the prints out, printouts, and you could ask anybody and they would simply tell you. There, there was no concept of proprietary software yet, and it, those were, I would say, better times. <laughs> than the one we are living in today, but but uh, thanks to conferences like this, we might go back a little and make make the world a little better with sharing our code and sharing our projects. Anybody else? Okay, so that's it. Let's